My name is John Baser, and welcome to my TV show, John's World. And today we're going to be visiting the Computer History Museum, and Chris Garcia is going to be our host. And Chris, could you tell us a little bit about the museum? Well, the museum actually started in Boston back in the uh, 1970s, and it was a part of Digital Equipment Corporation. And it was eventually spun off and became the Computer Museum in Boston proper. And then in the uh, late 90s, we actually moved out here to, uh, originally to Moffett Field, we're in a uh, 1940s warehouse. <laughs> And uh, 2002, late 2002, we moved out here to the, this wonderful new building. It used to be a former marketing center for SGI. So, you know, we've been here ever since. And we, this is our visible storage area where we have about 10% of our artifacts, but most of the really pretty ones on display. Mm -hmm. So you can see here a bunch of mechanical calculators. This is usually how uh, most of the mathematics was done up until about the 1950s. And these were literally just, you know, the original term computer meant a person who had one of these mechanical calculators and would just do continuous number crunching over and over again. Uh, so all your insurance tables, all your firing tables, everything were computed by humans using these calculators. And you know, it was kind of a boring job, but those were the first computers. And you know, it didn't really get applied to electronic machines until well after uh, the UNIVAC and all these early computers sort of came about. So this is where you know, the term computer started. This is actually a reproduction of one of the more important machines in uh, the history of computing and in American business also. This is the Hollerith machine, and this is used to do the census in 1890. And it was the first punch card system used for accounting. And you can see little uh, what they call the waffle iron, because when you close that, every hole in the card allows a pin to fall through, completing a circuit with a discrete pool of mercury, which does account. So really important machine. and. The Hollerith Company combined with two others to form IBM in the 20s. So, you know, all these roots sort of, you know, start at one little small concept and just explode out. And you can see all this IBM stuff, which all has its roots in the Hollerith Company. And IBM was always interested in doing uh, card punch work over the years. This is a machine called the Enigma. And the Enigma was used during World War II to encipher codes by the Germans. And uh, it was a really complex system. This actually gives you 150 quintillion possible combinations uh, for each number. So it was impossible to crack using standard, uh, just you know, single substitution methods. They did have some minor problems. Uh, one of the big ones was that they were noticing, the allies were noticing 10 character openings and closings. and they were sort of, you know, it's really standard, and you were seeing in all the messages. So they realized very quickly that, well, if I was a good German officer, I'd want to either sign on or sign off with Heil Hitler. So, you know, that allowed them to have a crib and work backwards. And so that helped them crack. They also managed to capture some of these. But the standard rule was that if you were a tank and you were captured, you shot your enigma before they took it. Uh, and that was the most important thing you could do. Uh, right next to it, actually, is a little piece. It's the only piece known to exist of an original Colossus. Colossus was, in a, was a sort of computer, almost. It was actually used just to do code breaking. So it would do uh, just combination and combinatorial concepts and just over and over again until they actually came up with something that made sense. And the British actually ordered this smashed into pieces no bigger than Winston Churchill's fist. Uh, but one of the days it was raining. A guy had a raincoat. This little piece was just there, and he put it in his coat. So the Brits are actually rather angry that we have this, and they don't. So, way to go us. Let's see right here, right after World War II, this little machine came online. This is called ENIAC. And this is only one part of ENIAC. This is one of 42 racks of this size. And it had 15,000 vacuum tubes, cost more than half a million dollars. And it, every time they turned it on and off, it caused a brownout in South Philadelphia, which, having lived in Philadelphia, uh, is not too surprising. But uh, this is one of the most important machines ever made. This could do 5,000 ads a second, which allowed them to do more mathematics in the 10 years this was running than all of humankind had done beforehand. So really an incredibly impressive machine for its time, even though it was not a stored program machine. Some of our machines are, are more important for the people who made them than for the machines themselves. This is one of them. This is called WISC, or the Wisconsin Integrally Synchronized Computer. And this is built, originally designed by a gentleman by the name of Gene Amdahl. And Gene Amdahl was 
originally trying to get an astrophysics degree, and they needed a way to uh, do some very complex calculations. So they sent him to the electrical engineering department to design a computer to do the calculations. Well, eventually he realized, huh, I'll just change. I'll just change my major, go to electrical engineering, and this is what he designed. Uh, he actually wasn't at Wisconsin anymore when uh, he was, when this was actually completed, he had actually gone on to IBM. But it was a really impressive machine. Uh, had could have four inputs at any one time, and up to two outputs. And it's a really strange machine. It has one of the best stories. Um, after it was decommissioned, it was given to one of the people who kept it up, and he put it down in his garage. Well, his son was an avid shooter, and liked to plunk cans off things, so he'd put the cans on top of the computer and shoot it. So you can see there are some bullet holes in here of uh, looks like a 22 and a couple of 45s, but uh, he wasn't a great shot, apparently. So that's really what one of those little things that, you know, stories that are almost entirely expected to get lost. And I like to joke that this is the computer that, you know, somebody actually did to this computer what everyone's wanted to do with a computer at some time and actually, you know, went out and shot it. <laughs> Pretty important piece of a really important machine. This is called the Univac 1 Mercury Memory Tank. And this was one of the first computers ever marketed. And Univac, for a good long time, really meant computer. Uh, electronic machine, and this is just a memory tank for it, and it has 18 little pipettes that have that hold up to, I believe, each one holds 10, 12 character words. So you know, there's not a lot of memory. I believe it's less than a megabyte and a half in an entire uh, Univac. But they managed to do useful work with it, which is rather amazing to me. Another machine of the era is the Johnniac, and Johnniac is one of those great machines that was one of the first generation of stored program machines. And what's incredible is that Johnniac was so advanced that they actually not only ran all the important calculations like uh, aircraft design and all these things, but they also started running payroll, inventory all on this machine. So it was really one of that first generation of you know scientific and business machines, which you know now every computer is. Over here is the largest computer ever built. This is a machine called SAGE, or the Semi-Automatic Ground Environment. And SAGE was an air defense network that the US Air Force had. And this did a lot of the really important stuff that we sort of consider for computing sort of started here. Things like a decentralized network. So basically, the, the origins of the internet were with this machine. Uh, 100,000 vacuum tubes in each site. Two CPUs, one always on warm standby, though they shared a memory. So if there were failures in one, they could just switch over to the other. Right here, you can see the weapons director. And so you'd see something blipping across the screen. And of course, the concept is that this is during the height of the Cold War. So you figure, well, anything that you can't identify that's blipping across the screen is obviously a Russian bomber coming to drop the bomb on New York City. So you could click on it with this light gun. And if there was any information in air traffic control, it would show up there. If not, the intercept technician would get the heading and so forth, and could launch missiles, they could scramble jets. It was really a very sort of paranoia-based machine system. But it ran for 28 years, this one coming out of North Bay, Ontario. And uh, by the time it actually came online, which is the amazing thing, uh, an intercontinental ballistic missile had already been designed. So that wouldn't even show up on the screen, it'd be moving so fast. So that sort of you know made this useless pretty much from the beginning. But it did do a lot of important things. About 70% of the world's programmers were working on this machine during the first years. And uh, one of the more imp other impressive things is that uh, this, when it was de decommissioned, the backbone that was built to connect them all was used by, um, I believe it was American Airlines, as the Sabre airline reservation system. So you know, all basis in, uh, in military ends up going into the private sector sooner or later. <laughs> 